what can you say on Easter morning? It's such a familiar story, but I make no apology for going over old familiar ground. And I titled my sermon this morning, A Tale of the Unexpected. You remember when we used to watch those television programs, Tales of the Unexpected? You were left hanging in suspense until the very last moments, and even then sometimes you were left without a, a definite answer to what you had been watching or reading. There is no doubt at all that the events that took place way back then at Calvary were a tale of the unexpected. From the very beginning, the disciples rebuked the Lord Jesus for his determination to go to Jerusalem and die. And they seemed to have missed altogether the final part. He always added that on the third day, he would rise again. And even as I read through this, I was struck, you see, in verse 11. And when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they did not believe. In verse 13, and, when, and they went and told it to the rest, but they did not believe them either. Later he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table and listened, and he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they would not did not believe those who had seen him as risen. Truly, a tale of the unexpected, and one which you and I need to be able to look at with fresh eyes, to behold again the wonder, the marvel, and the beauty of God's great work of salvation, that Christ, the Lord of glory, should die and rise again. In a sense, we should have expected it. Because he is God. Can God die? No. But of course they saw the man. The real man. The very real man. And they knew that when people died that was generally the end. Yeah, you've got Lazarus. But here's the man who raised Lazarus dying. You've got the widow of Nain's son who comes back to, death, to life. But here's the man that told them to sit up. He's dead. He's gone. All these years. Wasted. You can almost enter into their negativity. And so we want to consider here the wonder of knowing how the story finishes before we delve into it. It's like buying a new book to read and somebody tells you the last chapter. The rest of it, well, it's just information. We have the last chapter before us, and I'm really desperate in my own heart this morning to be lifted up in the spirit so that the thrill of it fills my heart and mind. I want to look at it with three subheadings of simple the empty tomb, the Easter message, and the ecstatic witness. That's a mouthful. Let's look at the empty tomb first of all. The narrative begins in the first four verses with these ladies all heading toward the tomb. Each of the four gospel accounts gives you details of different women that were there. And it's generally concluded that there was a group. And for various reasons, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John emphasize specific individuals. That does not exclude the others from being there. And here Mark tells us, And when the Sabbath was passed, that's Saturday, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, bought spices that they might come and anoint him. Very early in the morning on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. And they said among themselves, who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, for it was very large. The stone had been rolled away. You see, these people are absolutely convinced that Jesus is dead and gone. And you need to pick that up. And Mark uh, includes some details here which indicate to us that they're absolutely convinced that he's dead and gone. And that the very best they can do for him now is to pay him special respects at the end of his life. It was not the Jewish custom to embalm people. It wasn't even the Jewish custom to put spices on every corpse. It would be reserved for special people. 
It would be reserved for those who were held in high esteem and honour. And so these ladies, as they come, are paying their last respects. For thousands of years, people have been dying and staying dead. They expected no more. They had followed every step of his terrible demise. They had seen him taken, arrested. I'm not sure whether they visually saw the trial during the night, but they certainly would have known about it. And then being hauled off to Pilate, hauled off to Herod, and in each point of that, people taking opportunity to just let their spite out. The Romans hated the Jews. They were nothing but trouble. That's why there's so many of them in the city at Pentecost. So here's another Jew who will give him what for. And they did. Mercilessly. Beating him so much that when it came to carrying the crossbar of his cross, he collapses under it. You get a terrific picture, don't you? of these things happening and you remember in one of the accounts it tells us there was a group of women following weeping and the Lord Jesus turns to them and addresses them it's nice to see all the heads nodding because we know these stories so that these women would have been watching every brutal gruesome detail and one of the real commendations of the women is that when all the disciples except John had run away from the cross, who stayed? The women folks. They loved him with a special love. He had given dignity to women that society didn't give. It's one of the interesting things about the gospel account that women are given such a prominent place. You see, a Jew, a Pharisee, would pray every morning thanking God that he was not born a woman or a Gentile or a dog. And when you put all them together, you see just how people thought. And it's actually one of the major proofs of the reality of the resurrection that God chooses women to be the first witness. Their word didn't stand in the court of law. The glory of God comes right down to meet them at this point. So there they are, walking out to attend to the needs of the one that they love. They've actually been out and bought stuff to put on what they expected to be a corpse. They had bought spices that they might come and anoint him. Again, another indication that they're absolutely persuaded they're going to a corpse. It's true that Joseph of Arimathea had put some um, ointments and wrapped the body before it was laid in the tomb. But that was that man. They want to do it for themselves. You see it, don't you, when there's a public outpouring of grief. You know, the florists do an incredible business. As people feel the need just to express their own personal pain and sorrow. And so as they're coming along the road, the Gospels tell us they were up at the crack of dawn. One of the accounts says it was before dawn. My books tell me there would be a distance to walk from where they were living to where the tomb lay. And for that reason, it tells us in Mark's Gospel, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. Apparently the word in the original means when the rays of the sun were just penetrating the atmosphere. Six o'clock in the morning. They're up. And they're about this business. They want to show their love for the Lord Jesus. You remember one of the Marys previously in John chapter 12 took a pound of very costly oil and spike and art, anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair and the house was filled with the fragrance of it all. Jesus said, let her alone. She has kept this for the day of my burial. For the poor you have with you always, but me you do not have always. They've rested on the Sabbath. They're now on the way to the tomb. They're expecting only 
one conclusion. They're not even <coughs> considering whether he might be alive. There's no uh, indication that any of the light of what had been explained to the apostles as they were walking with them had penetrated the darkness. I want to paint the picture. I'd like you to get right into their shoes. All they can worry about is who's going to move that boulder. The Greek is quite helpful here. You don't often see it in the English, but there is in fact a form of the Greek which would indicate to us they weren't just talking about it. It wasn't, well, what will we do? It, the, the Greek tells us they were talking and talking and talking and talking about it. It was the subject of their discussion as they went along. They want to, to, to pay this last respect to their beloved Lord and what they thought would have been their Messiah. And there's a great big boulder in the way. But when they looked up, here is a mark of great wonder. When they looked up, that would indicate to me again that as they're going along the path, the heads are bowed. They're not just watching to see where to put their feet. They're actually low in spirit. They're broken in heart. And as they traverse that road, they know they're getting near. And somebody looks up. And there, to their astonishment, the stone was rolled away. Has somebody stolen the body? Is this the right place? Yes, they knew it was the right place. Because again, if I went back in the account, you will find that some of the, book, the ladies actually followed Joseph of Arimathea and watched where he was laid. There were individuals who might well have thought about stealing the body. The Pharisees were aware that the disciples themselves might have stolen it. And so they asked Pilate to put a guard on the, the tomb because these Christians might come and take his body and say he's raised from the dead. The Romans might have removed it so that these Christians wouldn't have a corpse to worship. So... Important, you know, Christianity differs from all other world religions. They all worship a container that they think has the bones and the remains of their leader in it. And that's not a new thing. So the Romans might have taken it. The Jews might have taken it. You can just about imagine the minds racing. What is going on? I need to get there and their feet would quicken. They would move closer and closer and then they come to the tomb. When they looked up, they saw that the stone was rolled away for it was very large and entering the tomb. Wow. They saw, and it's interesting that that's the first thing they see. They saw a young man clothed in a long white robe sitting on the right side and they said, hello, what are you doing here? No, they didn't. They're shocked. The word in the Greek means they're absolutely gobsmacked, to use a good Yorkshire phrase. Flabbergasted. Afraid. Wondering, who is this? What's going on? One of the other accounts tell us that the stone, when it was rolled away, was rolled away by an angel who came down and sat on it. And it tells us the guards were terrified. Here we meet an angel. How do I know? Well, Matthew tells me he was an angel. Tells me there were, no, it's Luke that tells me there were two of them. But again, it's not a contradiction. It's simply that the focus is on this one. The focus is on the fact that now where there should have been a body, there's an angel. I wonder if they actually did look at where the, 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 the actual body should have been lying or whether they were completely taken up with the angel because as we read the narrative on it, it, it frightens them out of their wits and they're on their way. The Lord of glory, listen to the words, 
Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. You're in the right place. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. As your mind's eye allow you to follow the actions of the angel as he points. John's Gospel tells us that when Peter and John go later, the clothes are actually lying where the body should have been. He had come right through the clothes. The cloth that covered the face lying to the side. This, dear friends, is an astounding picture to think about. That the Lord of glory was definitely dead, but now he's announced as alive. Can you even begin to feel what that must have been like on that first day? Imagine the greatest shock you've ever had. Imagine even a pleasant surprise if you've not had a shock. And how it really just shakes your whole being. Knees knocking and I bet every other part of their body knocking as well. This didn't happen yesterday. It won't happen tomorrow. This is a unique, special occasion. They loved him. They wanted to pay their respects. Where has the body gone? What's happened? How do, what am I to make of what this angel is saying? I've got written here, the tomb wasn't opened to let Jesus out. It was opened to let Mary and the others in. You need to recognise that, dear friend. And ask yourself whether that wonder still, still burns in your heart and mind. We live in such a busy world with so many things to do. When was the last time you sat down and just said, wow, to God about the resurrection? Never mind you, when was the last time I did? This is the biggest wow you can ever have. Take my grandchildren to the top of the Eiffel Tower a couple of years back. It's an incredible view, isn't it? You can see right over that grand city and all its beauty. And you can just hear their little mouths going, wow. It's right that we should, but here, dear friends, is a scene in which uh, we should be absolutely almost stunned into silence. And Christian, ask yourself, is that still so? You see, these women loved him. It's the mark of a believer. We've not just followed a philosophy, we've come into a relationship. We understand the warmth of his care for us and his compassion and tenderness. But of course, life has a terrible habit of just cooling us down. You remember the, 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 the Lord's message to Laodicean church, isn't it? I wish that you were either hot or cold, but because you are lukewarm, I will you out of my mouth. Christians should always be alarmed at the possibility of becoming complacent about the gospel. And how am I ever going to deal with that tendency to complacency? I'm going to come back here. There's a great deal more to Christianity, but this, dear friend, is the, the hinge on which the door of Christianity turns. And I need to spend time here looking, listening, thinking, wondering, entering into their perspective. And for the unbeliever, this is the distinctive mark of a Christian. Remember, the Roman soldiers were terrified and ran away. 
Too many unbelievers today they are running away from this material. They're not interested. They've no love for Christ. They've no interest in the gospel. Therefore, they're just going to clear off. Where does that love come from? We love him because he first loved us. How do I know he loved me? The God, the Holy Spirit works on my inside, gives me a new heart, brings me to the point where I repent and believe and embrace Jesus as my Savior. And that's impossible to communicate. We were having a discussion yesterday in the coffee bar. And, and, and there's a sense in which you, you can only lead the horse to water. You have to drink for yourself. And so for the unbeliever, some folk watch this online, it's for the unbeliever, I need to say to you, what you need to do is move beyond the theory into the experience. Did Jesus really die? Why? Answer the question in your head. Why? Was he a bad man? Most certainly not. Did he offend somebody important? Most certainly yes. He's a, a political victim in that sense, isn't he? But, but was it an accident? Did somebody do this to him against his will? No, he did it willingly. No man takes my life from me. I lay it down of myself. And as the unbeliever looks at this saviour, you then have to ask the question, why? Why? Here in his love, vast as an ocean, loving kindness like the sea, says the hymn writer. He did this because God so loved the world. Because God was demonstrating his own love. And that's where I'd like unbelievers to at least understand and then say to them, now it's time you made it your own. That's how I was converted, you know, I did a, a correspondence course, I knew Christians and I wasn't having any of it unless it was real. So I did two correspondence courses in actual fact. In Mayor's Bible School, they still exist. And Dr. Somerville comes to mind as being the man who marked my papers. I came home from work, three o'clock in the afternoon, it'd be about half past three, and there was my corrected answer sheets. And, I, and, and he commented, you've got all the answers right, he says, but has there ever been a time when you made it your own? And the Lord just dealt with me there and then. What I had been reading became mine, and has been for these last Nigh on 50 years, that's incredible, isn't it? The God of the Bible is well worthy of our attention. I'm going way off my notes. I need to pull myself back. Let's go back to the text. Let's look at that Easter message. Let's look at the commission of the, 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 the first witnesses. He said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter. A bold, brave, foolish man who was sure that nobody was going to interfere and kill his Lord and Master. Come too close, I've got a sword and off comes somebody's ear. He's okay with soldiers, but a little servant girl is enough to send him scouring away. It's hard to imagine how Peter must have been feeling. I let him down badly at the end. But the Lord has a message for Peter. It's normally understood that Mark's gospel is actually Peter's gospel. And Peter is actually then making sure that you understand that there was a message in the resurrection just for him. Just for everybody who's ever let Christ down. God's messenger is there to pass on God's message to men and women. With the purpose that God's message should be spread to the world by men and women. 
Go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him as he said to you. That verse troubled me when I was studying it. Because I know, like you will know, that he, he met them in the upper room. They were still in the city. That, dear friends, was a mark of disobedience. And a mark, too, of God's loving, gracious kindness. They do meet him in Galilee when Peter is restored, remember? Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? That's as they're fishing in the Sea of Galilee. But the point I want to get to here is that this message is a message which is worth sharing with the world. You seek Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified most definitely, most emphatically certified as dead. He is risen. He is not here. On the internet, I use Facebook as many of you know. Every Tom, Dick and Harry this morning is putting up a poster saying he's risen. Hallelujah, I enjoy them. But it's not just for our own personal consumption, is it? It's not just so the Christians can encourage us. We need encouraging and you need encouraging, I need it. But this, dear friends, is the message we need to get back to humanity. People often say, I, when they talk to me, I, I'm not religious. And I want to say, neither am I. But they don't understand the difference. And I've decided not to use that as an argument anymore because you get into a terrible loop about trying to understand what religion is. We want to communicate to them that Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, most certainly died and he is alive. The danger is, you see, that we look just at the dead Jesus or the empty tomb and, and we stay there. Verse 6, do not be alarmed. The original language in Greek, I've told you before, there are two words for no. One is a general no. And the other one is, I most certainly stop it right now. And that's what you have here. Instead of just being worried about what might happen to you or what you've lost or what you've felt, realize that this message is most emphatically a message for the world. One of the major proofs of the resurrection. You've got 11 fearful disciples hiding in an upper room one day, one week. And a few days later, they're out in the marketplace telling the world, He's alive! Jesus is alive. He rose from the dead. And what's more, because he's alive, you can live too. Oh, I'm challenging myself. Does the resurrection excite me or worry me? Does it have that place in my life where it's, where it's, where it's just got to be told? Are we like, like children? You know, you say to them, keep it a secret and they can't. God says, tell everybody, and we don't. I'm not here to beat you about the head. I'm talking to myself. I just need, I just need the reality of the resurrected Christ to be functioning in my life day and daily. And I came to church this morning. I thought to myself, right, when I meet people, I'm not going to say hello. I'm going to say he's risen. How many of you did I say that to? No. You see, we're caught, even in our own Christian groups, by this cultural respectability. The one thing a Christian needs to hear and be reminded of is that Jesus lives. And he lives in me. And he lives through me. And he has intended that to go back into the world. Don't be too hard on yourself. It's clearly a human problem in every age. For even as you see these accounts, verse 8, So they went out quickly and fled from the tomb, for they trembled and were amazed. And do you notice the next words? And they said nothing to anybody. They said nothing to anyone. 
Mary Magdalene hot foots it back to Peter and John and the other disciples we're told in John's Gospel and, and, and they can't believe it they're not going to believe a woman she's not a valid witness and so they're right to the tomb themselves and then they're back in that upper room two men on the road to Emmaus are walking when a third joins them and the, and, and, and the narrative tells us how gloomy they were this is what Luke 24 21 says we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel and deceit indeed besides all this today is the third day since these things happened yes and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us when they did not find his body they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive and certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said but they did not see him can you get the the, 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 the powerful discouragement that's in them even by hearing the tomb was empty even by seeing that the tomb was empty and the glory of Luke 24 of course is they invite this man to join them to eat and we're told that as they were eating and as he broke bread they realized it was the Lord and that brings home to me my God's determination for us to understand the power of his resurrection and the significance of it for my life it came as a message to a discouraged group of people John 21 verse 3 Simon Peter said to them I'm going fishing they said to him we're going with you also and they went out and immediately got into the boat and that night they caught nothing we know this, the rest of the story and we often concentrate on it but just that little bit lets you see how despondent they actually are how absolutely bewildered they are but right there there's an encouragement isn't there if you run your eye back to verse 7 but go tell his disciples not those who were his disciples they're still his disciples aren't they the Lord knows all about our weaknesses and tendencies to unbelief and discouragement and distraction but nonetheless we're still disciples and what we need to do is both to hear the message and meet the Savior because that's what's going to change them isn't it he's going to show himself to them these words would indicate that God is still for them and not against them go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee the words would indicate to us there's forgiveness now even for Peter there's forgiveness now even for you and I when we when we slip and and, and miss the point of being a Christian I was reading a devotion this morning on the subject of opportunity and I saw there a familiar little phrase one that often has intrigued me apparently in, in Greek mythology they had a god called opportunity and it had a tuft of hair on the front that was bald on the back opportunity must be grasped as it comes towards you because when it's past there's nothing to lay hold of and so it is the Lord is saying to them here is what you need you need to go you need to meet me you need to be aware that I'm alive and for you and me if you're anything like me and you're aware of many opportunities you've fluffed missed and ignored you could really get, dig yourself a pit for, miser for being miserable couldn't you the, the bunion slough of despond comes to mind but I'll avoid Mr. Bunyan we need to repatriate that dear man I've spoken about him too much I love Spaniards oh, it's irresistible at times I love the slow of the spawn because there's a prayer from the midst of it which is so simple that any Christian can use it 
What is it? Do you know the story? Four letters. Help! And Mr. Bunyan says, and help came. And lifted him out of the slough. And so as I read this and I see here little glimmers of light that he, he's alive, he's not just missing. And there's forgiveness. Then for me there's reason to step forward and to begin to sing hallelujah. We sang that hymn this morning and we're going to finish with a hymn. That, that's just the very same as it, hallelujah. Some people say, oh, all these hallelujahs. There's not enough. Hallelujah, Jesus is alive. Oh God, convince me. And so they do go forward as ecstatic witnesses. Now when he arose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him. Their mourning and weeping. And we know from the other accounts in the Gospel that that's the message that turns the world upside down. The two men on the road to Emmaus, when they realise who they've been sitting, eating with, they go and tell the disciples. The most dramatic event in history takes place on Easter Sunday and we're reminded of it. And, and before you say it's a pity it's only once a year, it's not. The reason Christians meet on a Sunday is because it's Resurrection Day. So that every Sunday for a Christian is a reminder of Easter. And there is the desire of the believers. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples' words, say Matthew chapter 28 and verse 8. A miracle has taken place. A miracle indeed. A miracle which means that life can never be the same again. Somebody has come back from the dead. And that then becomes the fuel of, of, of first century Christianity. Read the book of Acts. I've said it before. And underline every time they talk about the resurrection. They didn't only tell about the crucifixion. Important as it is. Fundamental to our Christian faith. That God has made an atonement for our sins. And that there is now therefore no condemnation if you're in Christ Jesus. But how do you know it worked? It says in Romans 4, 7, Christ died for our sins and was raised again for our justification. So that you might know that it worked. God had accepted the sacrifice and because he's accepted the sacrifice, now I am free. That's what said the apostles preaching throughout the first century. Paul writes, if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty and your faith is also empty. That's pretty powerful, isn't it? 1 Corinthians 15, 14. No resurrection. Christianity is just the same as every other religion. I listen to the Sunday program. On Sunday mornings, I find it harder and harder. This morning, they took 10 minutes to tell me that Friday, well, what was Friday special for? It was the anniversary of the birthday of the monkey god of Hinduism. Apparently, more than a thousand people met in London in one of their buildings to celebrate, I can't remember his name, but to celebrate his birth. And what really caught my attention was they sung this hymn which was 40 verses long. And then they were chatting to them afterwards. That's what's, that's what's going on in the world around you. That's what the media is reporting. You and I have something far more important. 
we have a risen Savior who died for us and who lives for us evermore. I need to finish, old man, time's gone. And I put it to you that you need to, to anchor down. Tonight I'm going to address the, the whole subject of the resurrection, so we'll get more evidence. But you need to get it into your thinking and into your mind, so that when you come up against the hard wall of unbelief, you've got, you've got the, the detonator. And that detonator is Jesus died, rose, and is alive. How do you know? Not only because it's in the book, because he lives in me. I embraced him as his saviour and he took up residence. It's a big responsibility. But as we've seen, God is very gracious, even with Peter. Lou Wallace was a famous general and literary genius of the 19th century who along with his friend Robert Ingersoll decided to write a book that would forever destroy the myth of Christianity. For two years Wallace studies in the libraries of Europe and America then he started his book but while writing the second chapter, the second chapter, he found himself on his knees crying out to Jesus Christ in the words of Thomas who had himself once doubted the resurrection, my Lord and my God. The book he was writing became the great novel about the times of Christ called Ben-Hur. Check the details. There are just so many accounts that when folk really sit down and look at this, it changes them. Therefore, surely my job is to get it to the attention of people. So that it's not just the Christians I'm saying he's risen to. I'm telling the world, he is risen. Paul writes at the end of Acts 17, I thought I had it written here for you. I've not. Let me just get the words. You remember he's been preaching in Athens and he has this very important statement to make. Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Why? Because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness. Yeah? How do I know it's true? By the man whom he has ordained, he has given assurance of this to all. You know what comes next? By raising him from the dead. That's the gospel. And that's been my privilege all these years to talk about. And that's how I want to finish my days, by God's grace. And it'd be wonderful, wouldn't it? Let me back up. It is wonderful to know the support and fellowship of my fellow believers. It would be wonderful, wouldn't it, to see it catching fire again in the hearts of my unbelieving generation. He is not here. He is risen. Hallelujah. This tale of the unexpected has been solved completely. Amen.